So it's good to be back in uh, St. Andrews. Uh, I've graduated 15 years ago. 15. Uh, I'm not sure whether I qualify for that you. <laughs> but you define it as anything less than 35, then I'm under that, right? Okay? So um, I am a marine biologist, uh, so I love the sea so much. Uh, so much so that wherever I go, uh, whenever it's overseas, I'll try to be near water. Right, so basically, I go to cruises, I go on beach resorts, uh, and even in in areas, I'll go for the waterfalls, find find you know as much water as I can. So basically, uh, what I want to share today is something that is very close to us. Okay, uh, I wanted to share something that happened a, a couple of years ago, and I'll start this story by highlighting this. So this is a whale, right? So for those who haven't heard of this, uh, basically in the 1940s to 70s, we do have whale skeletons in our National Museum. So it was up to then it was given away and that we didn't have a skeleton since. And this was important because it highlights the marine diversity in our very urbanized waters. So for some strange reason, in 2015, a whale of about 10 meters was washed up on shore. So this is a picture taken of Tuas. So the moment the public saw this, the government contacted NUS and said, well, there's a whale, do you want to come and take a look? So a huge bunch of colleagues went down and it was something that was very, very significant for us. Because, so they went down weeks, my colleagues went down week after week. Right? Spending days cutting through layers and layers of rubble. Okay? Right. So basically what we are looking at here is, so at the same time, right, they have to be very careful because there are instances where whales' carcasses explode because of accumulated gases. So they have to be there very carefully taking it out. So, and this was very significant because this was during SG-50. Right? So it's one of the years that was very important in our history. So they named this whale Jubilee. So with a lot of hard work from the scientists and a lot of support from the general public and also the different philanthropic organizations, we managed to get the whale's bones erected in our own natural history museum for all to learn, all to enjoy. So here comes the problem. While the researchers are there cutting up the carcasses, they found a lot of these. So these are plastics, right? So if you actually look closer, you can actually start to see the brand of that particular well, mineral bottle, mineral cup container there. So this highlights a huge problem. A whale in our waters has large amounts of plastics in the body. Right? And this brings me to what I want to focus on today. To look at how plastics are affecting not just the animals, but also us. So if you look at it, over there are five trillion pieces of paper of plastic, sorry, in the water, right, in our oceans. And this is only in the ocean, bearing in mind that we have not counted those in our landfills and those are found on land. These are purely just in our oceans, and there are like 12 zeros. Okay? So to give you a sense of how many these are, if you look at it, for every person in Singapore, there will be one million other pieces of plastics in our ocean somewhere, all right? And basically, it's 666 times that of the world's population this year. So all this trash comes up to be about 250,000 tons of plastics in our water. So again, to give you a sense, this is equivalent to 50,000 Asian elephants, or 3,500 20 level office stories, 20, le 20 level office buildings. And this is how much it weighs around our ocean right now. So the problem doesn't end here because uh, somewhere in Tokyo, a group of scientists, they looked at the amount of plastics in our waters. They found that, first of all, at somewhere near the surface where people can go and collect and start counting, uh, they are looking at about one plastic per square meter. But the problem is, in the seabed, there are 3.8 million per square meter. 
So which means to say the 5 trillion plastics that we are looking at is likely a severely underestimated number of the extent of the problems that we have here. And this poses a huge problem for the ocean. So it's slowly killing our ocean, and I'll just share with you some of the stories that you can easily read online. Okay? So first one of which, somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, there is an isolated, uninhabited area called the Midway Atoll. So bear in mind, nobody, but it's full of trash. The picture, if you look at it, you Google it, it's, it's scary. Uh, but on top of that, this particular island has a lot of great magnificent magnificent birds called the albatross. So birds being birds, right, they will start feeding their fledglings and all that. But they can't distinguish between a plastic and what's found in the nature. So basically, a, a film director called Chris Jordan in 2013, he went down to Midway Atoll to start photographing, you know, taking pictures of all the plastics that we find and especially those that are found within the carcasses and this is what he found. So plastics everywhere in the carcass. So you realize that the carcasses are starting to degrade, but the plastics are still there. So this is story number one. So another story that you probably will see online will be the story of this turtle. This turtle is called May West, right? So yes, she has a name, so May West. So at the early stage, when you're still a you know small turtle, it got stuck into a plastic ring, and because of that. When he was found, when she was found, the plastics were still there, the ring is still there, and the whole entire shell has been formed. So can you imagine how, how messy the intestine and the guts are? So this turtle survived for 20 years or more. Right? So, so these are the things that it's doing to our oceans. Okay? So but a lot of people think that well, you know, plastics and all that affect a lot of animals. In fact, it affects about 1,200 species of animals. So it's not just that, it's slowly you know, damaging our health as well. So if you look at some of the areas that we, have, we are looking at, so this is somewhere in Bulgaria. Water body full of trash and you can see people going up, cleaning up the area. And this is not just the only isolated case. In fact, it's one of the few cases that we, have, we are able to capture. So somewhere in India, you see, it's not difficult to see people walking around in water where it's full of trash. Bear in mind that the toxins can actually leak and leach in the water. So if you study geography, study history, you realize that wherever there's water, there will be life, wherever there's life, there will be cities. And one of the greatest establishments are usually found near the water bodies. Right? So imagine the impact that it has on the people living around the waters. So this is a picture I've taken in Qingdao, China. Uh, it's a coastal city, and food, seafood in particular, is very, very dominant uh, in such areas. So you actually see food such as shrimps, oysters, different kinds of shellfish, and the streets go you know, by hundreds of meters, and it's not just in one part of the city, but in multiple parts of the city. So the sheer amount of the seafood that people consume is enormous. So, the thing here is, this, a couple of years ago, scientists started discovering, wow, you know, plankton, which are very small microscopic organisms found in the sea, are consuming plastics. So this green stuff that you see, these are all plastics. So at first they were thinking, finally we found a solution to the plastic problem. Because we can actually eat, we can increase the number of plankton in the water, it will help us reduce plastics. Make sense? So, but it's not long after that that we realize that we are in for a huge problem. Because if plastic starts to accumulate in small little organisms, so by bioaccumulation, you expect that small little organisms, as you go up the food chain, plastics will be found in various organisms, including the food that you and I eat. So recently, after the conference, we, we found out that plastic is creeping into our lives gradually and it's making a long-lasting impact. So they have found that a lot of shellfish and a lot of intestine of fishes actually contains uh, a lot of plastics. And the most common fish that we eat, ikan bilis or anchovies, these are the ones that with the highest concentration of plastics in their intestines. And we are eating them whole. Right? Bear in mind that ikan bilis you don't tear apart and then you, you 
result, right? So you just, you know, it's then poor. So these are the problems that we are facing. Okay, it's coming into our diet, right? So in Singapore, we are starting to find traces of this as well. So this is a, a picture of uh, a crab that we have collected off one of our reefs. So we find that, you know, there are plastic tracks like this. They are found entangled onto different crustaceans. Okay, so we find that these plastics are not just in this isolated sample. We have tons of samples that we have collected and it spans from crabs, isopods, and it also extends to snails. So all these things are present in our waters as well. But as cliche as it sounds, every one of us has a part to play. Right? So we have all heard about this, well since you know kindergarten, primary school, we've heard all this, but this is something you can do. But I cannot emphasize this enough. Because you cannot, uh, it, there's, no, there's no way that you can avoid eating seafood. There's no way that you can uh, eliminate it out of your diet entirely, right? So, but that also doesn't solve the root problem, and this, okay, is the one that can play a part. So I'd like to share, beyond what we do with this, in College of Alice and Peter Tan, uh, where I also teach at a university, so our college ethos is basically community engagement and active citizenship. So for this group, so our, our student population is very mixed. We get students from law, medicine, uh, social sciences, engineering, uh, all sorts, because we are teaching general electives. So the thing here is that these people are not environmentalists, but we try to make an active effort to weave it into the curriculum. So basically every semester we get our students to do cleanups like this. So within a span of one and a half hours, 30 students collected about 33 bags of trash and 236 kg work. So bear in mind okay, that this particular site is a site that is not the usual uh, publicly accessible parts of beaches that we have. Because on normal public beaches, we actually have contractors helping us clean. But areas like this, this is Lim Chu Kang, it has not been cleaned. There's no active effort in cleaning this. So these students came down and helped us clean up the, the beaches. And also on top of that, two months before, there's actually a huge massive effort for cleaning up the area already. So two months after, we're still getting about 236 kg worth of trash. So this is ridiculous. But we have to make them do that because we want to see, make, help them see this difference. So this is a picture taken before and after. So we get students to you know, pick up some of the trash here, and then after that, they make a huge difference. But the idea here is not, to, not just to educate, but it's to get them empowered with the sense that you know, as, even as an individual, you can make a difference. And this particular patch is only cleaned by, say, three students. So they can make a lasting impact, and this is what we want to collect. And these kind of activities are very impactful, because in the reflection, when we, after the event, we ask them for reflections, you can see the huge transformation. The first thing that comes to your mind will be number one, how complex environmental problems are. Because when you pick up every single trash, I tell them, you know, take a look at it, see whether you can guess where it's from. And they get very mixed results. And more often than not, they cannot discern where the source is. And second, they also start to appreciate that basically in areas like this, Singapore, we are not immune to environmental problems. We are not immune to marine trash. This is something that they can actually learn out of this experience. So there are many of these activities that all of you here can actually participate. It doesn't have to be in a class setting, it can just be a community effort. So start, gradually we are starting to weave in education, environmental education, but we want to do it in such a way that we work with our partners. So we don't go in telling the partners, you know, the schools what to do, but rather we want our students to go down and listen to their problems and come up collectively with a solution. So over this semester, we have actually got several students to work with students from Nanhua Secondary to see how we can help them with sustainability and leadership. And in particular, this time around, we are focusing on food waste. So these are the things that our students are actually doing. But you realize that you know every month I ask them for a reflection so that they don't forget what they actually do. So you realize that the students find you know such problems very, very difficult to solve because in such a setting, you actually get varying expectations and things change over time. But this is what we need students to understand because problems like this, it's not something that you can just solve with one particular policy. It's not something that you can just solve with one initiative. It's something that has to be well thought out and 
we have to work very closely with partners. So apart from that, you know, I've started this initiative for our Singapore Reefs. So the primary reason why we want to do this is basically to provide education about marine environment. So the second most important thing is that we want to form a platform where different organizations can come in and help. For example, we are organizing this particular activity on June 6, June 4, which is a couple of, uh, which is about a week from now. So this is to commemorate World Ocean Day. So we've got to together government agencies, we've got together NGOs, we've got together scientists, we've got together the public, all together in the same place, so that they start to understand the problems that the marine environment faces. Because unlike the land, right, where you can actually get easy access, things under the water, we often forget because we don't see it, but the problems are there. So to end up the whole thing, I think it's important here, in, for every one of us to play a role in giving the oceans a chance to survive. Not just for the ocean, but also for us. My time in SAGC was the best time I had. And most importantly, it has equipped me with the skills to, you know, to help me to become what I am today. And more importantly, it gave me and helped me find my purpose in life. So I hope at some point, you start to find your purpose and you start making a difference because you, you, all of you here are young, passionate, a lot of energy and you can definitely make a difference to people's life. Thank you.